Well, welcome to another edition of Pancreas School, and we're expanding this uh, today to uh, involve a couple really great invited guests. And I'm so lucky to have Dr. Clesia Clark and Dr. Alex Fan joining me because they're international experts in today's topic, which is neuroendocrine tumors. And you can see here within the Laban Pancreatic Cancer Program, we're lucky enough to have the James and Marsha Hawk Program in Neuroendocrine Cancers. So a, a huge shout out to Marianne and Pete Laban, as well as uh, Jim and, and Marsha Hawk for all of their support. Um, well, we'll start, we'll dive right in and start out. Um, so Alex, um, where, what are neuroendocrine tumors? You can see my little outline. Uh, for those of us uh, in surgery, we always need to have a little outline. Fortunately, we have the world's greatest medical oncologist, Dr. Fan, who doesn't need an out outline, but what are neuroendocrine tumors? So first and foremost, thank you for being here. And I'm, I'm really happy to be here and to be talking about something I'm really passionate about is neuroendocrine tumor. Well, neuroendocrine tumor is a very heterogeneous group of cancer, but neuroendocrine tumor comes from neuroendocrine cells. And neuroendocrine cells actually is a combinations of um, um, the neuron, uh, the, the nervous system and the endocrine system. It is the, it's stimulated by nerve to secrete uh, granules that are endocrine granules into the bloodstream. So the common um, binding or the common theme for all these neuroendocrine tumors is they must have secretory granules in their pathologies. So neuroendocrine tumors are cancer that can produce hormone as well as cancer that can produce bioamino uh, um, that doesn't have any functionality. So these are um, a uh, very rare group of cancers. But the fascinating thing is some of the neuroendocrine tumors, mm -hmm. and maybe you can comment also, Alex, on the difference between, we often are, are uh, the people who view this video will oftentimes get confused over terminology mm -hmm. as we do in medicine. So neuroendocrine tumors can produce hormones, some of which can produce syndromes. In other words, patients will have symptoms because of that. Right. And what is the difference between a tumor and a cancer? Because they'll go to their doctor and the doctor will use both of those terms. Yeah, so that, that the term <coughs> tumors, cancer, malignancy, neoplasm is used interchangeably, but a cancer is oftentimes for us as a medical oncologist and people who take care of cancer are that they have the potential to spread to other sites, be invasive. It is a malignant process that can invade other organs, that can outgrow the site where it started from, so it's not confined, so that's, that's what a cancer. A tumor is a growth, but it may not have invasion to another system, into the bloodstream or not. So. And with neuroendocrine tumors slash cancers, it becomes more complicated mm -hmm. because um, most of them actually have the biological ability to spread, right. but we may get to them early enough mm -hmm. so that the patient is cured, right? Yes, right? yes definitely. Neuroendocrine tumor is, one, is a very rare cancer that even in the setting of metastatic, you can convert into a chronic condition or a curative setting in the long term. So yes, um, it, yes really complicated and we'll, yeah. and we'll, shed, we'll discuss this more over the next few minutes. So Calicia, um, where do these neuroendocrine tumors live? I mm -hmm. think that's another area and I'm going to draw my little, my little patient up here, okay? Mm -hmm. So we'll make, give him a happy face, but then we're going to come down to the chest. Mm -hmm. I'll put a little diaphragm in here. So we have the lungs mm -hmm. and then we're going to bring the esophagus right down, and we'll have the stomach. I'm going to, I didn't leave enough room for the liver here, but we'll put the liver right here. My other videos are probably a little bit better. The most important or organ in the body, <laughs> the pancreas, we'll put right here. This is the first part of the small intestine called the duodenum. We'll put that here. Then you have a bunch of small bowel, feet of small bowel mm -hmm. that then leads to the colon. Okay, we'll put the colon here. And then that all comes down to the rectum here. 
Jay, you'll have to keep up with us here. Yeah, but okay. anyway, that's a little bit view of the net. So where right. can neuroendocrine tumors live? Well, so the short answer is really anywhere <clears throat> in the body um, uh, that you just discussed. The most common sites are going to be the small intestine, um, which extends from the duodenum all the way to the colon. Um, another common site is uh, the pancreas, uh, uh, which we'll talk a little bit more about today. And then the lungs um, are a common site for primary tumors to start. But we always treat patients that have lesions also in the stomach. We have uh, neuroendocrine tumors that can be found in the colon, in the appendix, really all over. Another common site for patients to have neuroendocrine tumors is in the liver, but those tend to be metastases or spread from one of these other primary sites. So you can have lesions in the liver that have spread from the pancreas, livers in the, uh, lesions in the liver that have spread from the small intestine, or even the lungs. And so that tends to be more associated with metastatic disease. And so a, a question that my patients oftentimes ask me is, so if you have a neuroendocrine tumor mm -hmm. that starts out in the pancreas, mm -hmm. how does it get to the liver? Right. So essentially what we think is these cancers shed their cells um, and they get distributed into the bloodstream and then um, these uh, cells basically then float around in the bloodstream and eventually they bite, they get carried into the liver. The liver is very fertile. It's got um, a very rich blood supply, and so it's very easy for those cells to sort of leave the bloodstream and, and then enter the liver parenchyma, and then they can start growing there. So it's a, it's a favorable yeah. spot for neuroendocrine tumors to grow. It's just fascinating yeah. how that, how that is the case. So if we, since this is pancreas school, I'm focusing a little bit on pancreas, mm -hmm. and uh, for those of you who want to learn more about neuroendocrine tumors that primarily arise in the lung, um, and other parts of the body, uh, please feel free to contact, and we'll provide the information, contact Dr. Fan, Dr. Clark. I mean, one of the areas that Dr. Clark is really the world's expert on is neuroendocrine tumors that arise in the appendix, the small intestine, especially the latter part of the small intestine called the ileum, and in the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine. We're gonna talk for a minute about neuroend neuroendocrine tumors in the pancreas, so if it's sitting in the pancreas, mm -hmm. Calicia, yeah. um, what would be the treatment? So I think let's start about, well, who do you even see first? So I think it's very confusing for patients because these neuroendocrine tumors can be all over the body to understand that if you have a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, you're looking for two things. You're looking for a person that, especially in a surgeon, a person that has expertise in neuroendocrine tumors, but also in actually pancreatic surgery. Um, the pancreatic surgery is a little bit more complex, and we know that the outcomes are much better if that person has a lot of experience working on the pancreas. Um, so I think there are a couple of things that we want to know before we can decide how we treat a patient. Um, the first thing is, um, what kind of uh, tumor are we uh, dealing with? So in general, um, the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors fall into two broad categories. Um, they can either be functional, which means they're secreting a hormone that causes a problem. One of the most common functional um, tumors is like an insulinoma that secretes insulin and it causes hypoglycemia or low blood sugar. Or they could be non-functional, which means they're not producing a uh, hormone that's active, but they're still uh, a, a tumor and many of these have um, uh, malignant potential. So for functional tumors, um, those are really primarily treated with surgery um, because we know that the best way to reduce the hormone production that is excessive is to actually reduce the number of cells sure. that are making the hormones. So surgery plays a really critical key in almost all functional tumors, even in the setting of distant metastasis. And so those are patients, if they have stage four disease or liver mets, that um, Dr. Fan and myself would meet and we would really talk about um, the sequencing of therapy, whether we do surgery up front or we try to do some shrinkage of those tumors first and then surgery on the back end. So if we think for a minute that the tumor is confined to the pancreas, mm -hmm. okay, we do, a, typically the patient would have a CT scan Absolutely. or an MRI. And a dotatate and a, scan. And a dotatate. So uh, we've, we now hear about this dotatate yeah. scan. Dr. Fan, what is a, a dotatate scan? Because it's kind of unique to these neuroendocrine tumors, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so the uh, somatostatin <clears throat> is actually an endogenous um, hormones that is produced in the body. Neuroendocrine tumors um, actually has receptors that are somatostatin receptors, mainly two. They're highly expressed in um, uh, neuroendocrine tumors. So dotatate our PET scan, our functional PET scan that have replaced octreotide scan now, 
they're looking for somatostatin receptor tumors. And these, specifically, they're looking for neuroendocrine tumor. By doing a PET dotate, it serves two purposes. One is to look for the extent of neuroendocrine tumor within the body, staging them. And the other is to see if the patient can be a candidate for um, um, Additional peptide, use. PRRT treatment in the future. Sure. So sometimes doing a PET dotate is very useful when a patient presents with liver metastasis, but you don't know where the primary is from. By doing that, you can probably can isolate and find or search uh, for the primary site. So for the, for the uh, patients and their families who are watching this who are affected by, by this disease, they have a neuroendocrine tumor in the pancreas, the intestine, uh, the, the, the lung, et cetera, they would typically get a dotatate scan. It's mm -hmm. one of the few diseases mm -hmm. where a dotatate scan, which scans the whole body, really provides a sensitive indicator of the extent of the disease. Mm -hmm. We don't have that many cancers yeah. where we have a test like or, or a, a scan like the dotatate PET, right? Yes, yeah. And what happened, what would you do, Alex, if <clears throat> the typical scenario that we see frequently, a patient with a non-functioning neuroendocrine cancer tumor of the pancreas, um, on the dotatate scan, there now are multiple spots in the liver. The patient is doing well. Frequently you see this in someone who is in their 50s, 60s, sometimes even 40s, right? Otherwise healthy person. And um, they got a CT scan because they were in a little car accident or something else. And they have a neuroendocrine, would you call that a cancer or a tumor? And it's spread to the liver. The fact that, it, the, the, tumor, <coughs> the fact that you have a primary site in another location, meaning it has spread to the liver, I would call that neuro, it's a malignant process, but it's still referred as neuroendocrine tumor. It is a cancer, but it's still referred to as neuroendocrine tumor. Uh, one of the areas where it's pretty confusing for our patients and their families in the medical literature, because even the literature refers, this, refers to this as pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, tumor. or PNET. Right. Mm -hmm. It's abbreviated, even though when it's spread to another part of the body, it's actually a cancer. Right. right? What is the role for, and Alex, you're an expert on this, what is the role for something other than surgery first, and why would you not just go in and try to just cut everything out? I mean, surgery is always something, when a patient presents with neuroendocrine tumor, especially pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, we always evaluate if surgery would play a role before or after. But systemic therapy, treatment, if we go back a little bit and uh, look at the biology of this, a tumor that starts in the pancreas that has spread to the liver really is in the bloodstream or lymph node to go there. So while surgery is always add, have benefit, and is always something we look for as an option, we need to also consider systemic therapy to control their disease that we may not be able to see outside of what can be seen on imaging. So systemic therapy such as somatostatin analog or targeted therapy or even oral chemotherapy is considered. But it's mainly trying to see how we can either, the purpose of systemic therapy is to understand the natural history of disease. Is this disease a long, in, indolent disease or a very fast growing disease? Is this disease going to be uh, cytoreductive enough for us to do the surgery that may not be so extensive or large uh, surgery? So there are very re as reason why it's important to um, take care of patient with neuroendocrine tumor in a multidisciplinary fashion. It's not an independent person who make that decision. I make that decision with you guys, as well as our other colleague in um, interventional radiology, as well as nuclear medicine. So, so important, as you, you brought up, uh, interventional radiology, nuclear medicine, medical oncology, with a real focus on neuroendocrine tumors, surgical mm -hmm. oncology with the same focus. Mm -hmm. Kalisia, I'll give you the last question, yeah. and, we can, and we'll have well, additional episodes of pancreas school which focus on each of these little areas of treatment. But um, why would you operate on someone with a pancreas neuroendocrine tumor mm -hmm. that has spread to the liver? And our patients are kind of familiar with adenocarcinoma mm -hmm. of the pancreas where if the tumor has spread to the liver, we typically would not view surgery as helpful. Right. Why is the neuroendocrine space different? So I think it's different for a couple of reasons. <clears throat> First, 
Um, the prognosis um, uh, for neuroendocrine tumors in the pancreas is uh, very different from uh, pancreatic adenocarcinoma. So many patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors will have an expected um, survival of decades, even, even in the setting of metastatic disease, if they have low-grade disease. So there are three broad categories of grade, with grade one being the lowest grade. And those tumors tend to really respond well to treatment with surgery and a combination of some um, systemic treatments. And so we can really extend life for those so patients. So the grade is really how nasty they look under exactly. the microscope. That's right? Exactly. That's exactly right. And the pathologist right. says nasty is high is high grade, grade three mm -hmm. and not so nasty, kind of friendly is it's grade, grade one. one. Right. So much better to have a friendly tumor. Exactly. Um, and so the pace of disease um, then even in the pancreas or the liver is much, much different. And we have more effective treatments to, to sort of keep any cells that we can't see at bay for a longer period of time. And then data actually shows that you can extend overall survival in patients with stage four disease if you can resect about 90% of all the visible tumors that you can see on CT scan. So by what we call a debulking surgery, even if we can't remove every single spot in the mm -hmm. liver, if we can remove 90% of the disease in the liver and the pancreas, and then get them to additional treatments with systemic therapy, those patients do far better than patients that don't get any surgery at all. So neuroendocrine tumors, almost unique in the cancer field. Very much where so. Where we can treat them a little bit like a snow pile, mm -hmm. keep the snow pile down. Exactly. And they live a little bit longer. Live a little bit longer. N not the case with the other cancers that both of you take care of frequently. Right. The regular old kind of pancreas cancer, mm -hmm. probably cancer of the stomach, esophagus, exactly. et cetera. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, Dr. Kalisa Clark, Dr. Alex Fan, thank you very much for joining me in Pancreas School. We'll have you back again soon. Thanks for Thank having you. us.